I'm Sarah McBride, HRC's National Press Secretary, and I am here with Delegate-elect Danica Rome, the first openly transgender person to be elected to and who will later serve in a state legislature. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I know so many people were incredibly excited after your election, incredibly hopeful. I'm curious what you were thinking in the moments after you found out that you won this race. Well, I guess my immediate moments uh, after I found out I won was, wow, Joe Biden just called me, who I know is a dear friend of yours. Um, how do I process this? Um, I just don't feel like standing anymore. So I decided that I was just going to hit the ground. And then that viral video, um, photo of me went out. I mean, just being completely overwhelmed with my hands over my face. and. I was making all the motions of being, of sobbing without the tears because I was dehydrated, um, way, way, way sleep deprived. And just after 10 months and four days of you know campaigning, way past the brink of exhaustion. So it was just like, yeah, now's a good time to just <laughs> drop to the ground and let the moment happen. Um, but that was, it was special. And then, you know, once as the night was going through and then it became really like, all right, it's celebration now and it's also time to get down and work. I mean, like I have a really nonplussed attitude about winning. It's not just like I'm going there going like, yes, we just won the Super Bowl. Woo. It's really like, wow, I got a lot of work I got to get done, you know, because I got a lot of campaign promises I got to deliver. You know, I've pre-filed like 13 or uh, yeah. So I submitted for legislative drafts like 13 um, bills so far, and they're dealing with everything with utilities, transportation, um, to shield law, you know, to protect credential news reporters, to you know, Freedom of Information Act. I mean, you know, I'm getting down to nitty gritty of governing already. So I, I know that. Um you know, you ran on so many different issues. You ran on yeah. issues that were near and dear to your community's heart. Uh, and you ran against an opponent who described himself as the state legislature's chief homophobe. And so a lot of, a lot of folks feel like your election and the elections in Virginia in general represented sort of the politics of progress winning over the politics of hate. It, do you see it that way? And, and sort of what do you think this message sends? Well, I think that the message that sent was that you had 12,077 voters in the 13th district who looked at me and said, yep, she'll do, you know, whatever their individual motivation was. A lot of them, you know, I had, I remember like very, very late on election night. It's like within the last 15 minutes, torrential downpour. I'm wearing plastic bags over my feet inside my shoes because it's just pouring down and I can't afford boots. <laughs> and this guy comes up and he asked me about what's my position on tolling 66. I was just like, I oppose all tolling roads in Northern Virginia because, you know, I think we should be dealing with gas tax and all this other stuff. And, you know, public roads shouldn't be sold out for private profit and it's a double tax. You know, we shouldn't have to pay again for, you know, roads we're already using. He goes in, he comes back, he said, I voted straight Republican until I got to you and then I voted for you. And that sort of stuff right there where he wanted change, but at the same time, he was also willing, he very much was focused on the message. Here, you know, I ain't wearing makeup. I'm absolutely soaked. I'm drenched. i am got an umbrella that is not too happy about staying put the way it is. Like I'm doing my Mary Poppins, like, you know, like this. And he didn't care. He was just like, just fix my commute. You know, that's, that sort of stuff, that matters a lot. And, you know, the, the top of the ticket out ran me. But part of that is we pushed out so many people that even when you're running against a 26 year incumbent, of course there's gonna be ticket splitters. Of course there's gonna be people who are gonna say that, you know, he came to my house in 1995 and I haven't forgotten since. Okay, like I respect that, that's cool. But my job is to serve them now. My job is to make sure that as a candidate to get our voters out. Well, we did. And we got it out to the point where I set our general election win number at 12,161, and that was the ceiling. We were not gonna be able to go higher than 12,161, and we got 12,077, 99.2%. <laughs> that was pretty good. Um, and I realized that with turnout that high and with that many people validating my campaign, the idea was, all right, the message that you had above all, that's what people just accepted, and you need to go fulfill it they accept and they trust you because you're trans, because you're a journalist, because of all your identifiers. They're fine with that. Go succeed for them. 
That's a really uh, unifying thought in, in an era yeah. that feels really divisive right now. And, and you've talked about how this race wasn't just a byproduct of, of you and your work. It was also all of the volunteers yeah. from in the district, advocacy groups. I'm, I'm curious um, if you could sort of talk about what you saw in terms of just this groundswell of, of grassroots and organizational support. It's never for your happened campaign. before. It's never happened in House delegate for House delegates campaign like that before. You don't have House of Delegates candidates having a hundred volunteers come out in one day, let alone, you know, like going down the stretch in October on a typical Saturday, 50 volunteers was normal. It was just like, oh, we only had 50 days. You know, it's like, that's incredible. Because like when in 2015, um, our Democratic nominee, he told me he had 15 volunteers once. And it's not that he was a bad candidate. It was just, it was a different year, different time. And at the same time, I like to think that what I was able to bring to the table here was inspirational for other people to want to get involved not just to express their disdain against you know the president or even against Elliot Marshall but because they believed in the message they believed in the candidate they believed in what we were doing collectively and they believed in that message of you know fixed transportation don't enable discrimination you know like that sort of stuff whatever your motive for getting in was it was really incredible to see so many people from within the district and then all across the country pitching in. Where, you know, I have people driving from Chappaqua, New York to go knock on doors for me in Stonewall Precinct, where in the Democratic primary we won by two votes. So that those doors mattered, by the way. That that long haul from a trans woman who ran for office up there, Kristen Brown, she came all the way down, knocked doors, and came and went back. I think she did a DC event that night too, but then I had people driving up from Charlottesville, from Richmond, from Maryland, D.C., people coming in from all over wanting to help. And then phone banks out in California, Massachusetts, and New York, and in Maryland, and D.C. again, and not to mention, of course, in Virginia, where we're from banking all the time. And so having this giant collective of people who believed in the message, got organized, got engaged, and then won a campaign, that is testament to the fact that when we unite, we win. When we vote, we win. When we trust a message, a trust the messenger, and we rally around that person, we win. That model has to be replicated time and time and time again. It can't just be, wow, we got Danica elected in 2017. Wasn't that cool? Yeah, it's a good moment. We have a lot more elections to win. We have a lot more public policy that we need to get passed. We need a lot more inclusive people in office who are focused on infrastructure, who are focused on you know the things that unify our community. And we need people in office who have the capacity for empathy to make sure that you know the poorest of the poor among us, or even just middle class folks who are struggling, whoever it is, that no one feels left behind and no one is left behind by, you know, because of something that the government did. I've got to be able to knock doors over at Bull Run Mobile Home Community Park over in Yorkshire and talk to those people with a straight face saying, I'm doing the best I can for you. Just the same as when I go to the McMansions out in Gainesville. The notes that I left on the door in the mobile home park were the exact same notes that I was leaving out, out there. And you know why? Because those people there have dignity too. And that's the stuff that I will never forget. The first time I accepted a thousand dollar donation, I got it from the post office. I said, wow, it's a really big check. I should go knock doors over the uh, mobile home park. That's what I did because I never, ever, ever wanted the idea that, you know, we're, you know, getting big money coming in to ever dissipate the message and ever dissipate the intention that I was setting, which is I'm here to take care of everyone in my district. I'm here to be a champion for them. And the north-south alternative to 28 runs right next door to them, and I need to make sure that these people have you know, the best commute that they can, that they can get to work just like anyone else. Yeah. One of the things that, as a trans person, I think mm -hmm. really struck me positively about your campaign is that while, of course, you ran on the issues that voters and constituents cared about in your district, you never ran on your identity, but you never ran from your identity. Right. And you talked about your identity. I think one of the powerful things about trans people running for office is that I think when you talk about dignity, we've, we, we know what it feels like to be on yeah. the outside. We know what it feels like to, to feel like the government isn't seeing us or addressing our issues. And so you know, I, I'm curious what you hope this election 
and your victory and your service sends, the message it sends to transgender youth across Virginia and around the country? The message that I hope it sends to transgender youth, you know, in Virginia and across the country is that you can succeed because of who you are, not despite it. You should be respected, welcomed, and celebrated because of who you are, not for what discriminatory politicians tell you you're supposed to be. And that this is really at its very, very most basic, you know, pushing over oppressors and saying, no, this is my commonwealth too. This is my America too. And that, you know, when I put out the digital ad, for example, um, that came, you know, we recorded that two days after Delegate Marshall said, why do you call Danica female? The Danica's DNA changed. And so we had three LGBT kids, um, including one, tra you know, one trans boy who was there too. Um, well, he was the first one of the three. And in that ad, it just says, this is who I am. And you know, it shows, you know, my spironolactone, it shows my estradiol, you know, it's, it's very, very blunt about exactly what it is that I'm here to, to do. And the message there was, and when the speaker says the gentlewoman from Manassas, it would actually be the gentlewoman from Prince William. But, and the Democrats need a majority to be, for me to be called gentlewoman now, apparently, but that's a different story. But the idea was, you know, like when they see me on the floor of the House of Delegates, LGBTQ kids everywhere will, will know they can succeed because of who they are, not despite it. That message, when we got that out there, instantly, Danica's just made her transgender identity a central message in the campaign, and this and this and this. I, started, I got attacked in mailers because of it. I was getting beat up in the press with it. I was like, y'all missed the boat. Y'all missed the point. This wasn't about me. This is about those three kids. This is about sending a message of hope to those kids that you and I didn't have when we were 14. You and I didn't have that candidate running for office you know, who was out there saying, yeah, I'm transgender and it is also very, very okay for every other person who's like us to run for office, to succeed in however it is that, you know, what, in whatever it is that they want to do. Imagine, you know, I, I got a call after that ad came up from uh, Day Pope, who's with Trans United Fund, and she told me on the phone, she goes, I wish I saw a message like that when I was 14. And I told her back, I do too. I just, I, that absolutely is true. And I think your election gave not just young people hope, but yeah. so many trans people of every age hope. I, you, yeah, you said- Yeah, trans people get stuck on 28 too. Yeah, that's right, yeah. <laughs> like I said- Traffic like a, is a trans issue. Right, right, yeah. right, right, right. right. Like, like I told uh, Jordan Klepper on the opposition, I said like, trans people, we don't, it's like as transgender people, we don't get to fly our unicorns to work every day. They don't open the unicorn express lanes, you know, on weekdays, only on Thanksgiving and weekends. So that's okay. Holidays we, are special we, for us, we, yeah. We, we, we are allowed to use them then, but it's like, no, like we have to deal with the same quality of life issues as everyone else. That re-emphasizes the message that we are a part of our communities too, and our communities are a part of us too. So you've hit the ground running. You're working with yeah. fellow delegates. You're, you're supporting folks uh, that are running for office. What's, what's life been like since the election? What are, you, what are you up to now? So since the election, I've made at least six house calls to different constituents. Um, just like, you know, I got invited from one constituent who said, if the Dominion power towers um, go along I-66, this is what's gonna happen to my backyard. If they bury the lines along I-66, this is what's gonna happen in my backyard. Can you come over to my house? I wanna show it to you. Sure, tell me the day, I'll be there. And I was, <laughs> and you can see the digital. <laughs> um, and so it's like being able to make those house calls immediately. And you know when I'm getting emails from constituents and then they send their phone number with it and I call them personally and I say, hey, I get your email, this is Anna Karam, how you doing? You know, oh, wow, I, it's, it's you. Or they go, that was fast, okay. I wasn't expecting to hear from you. I was expecting to hear from like a staffer or just like a form letter or something. No, no talk to me. Like, well, I, I don't wanna take up too much of your time. I was elected for you to take up my time. <laughs> That's like why I did this. So please take up my time. This is why, I, this is the stuff I love doing. I love constituent service work. I, I heard from um, one parent who said that her and, and her um, kid, they went to the DMV, they had to wait an hour just to get inside. They waited another hour and a half inside. They get so frustrated they end up leaving. And they said, can you do anything to help us out? Well, they have another appointment coming up this week, and Delegate Alex put in a phone call <laughs> and is going to stop over at DMV saying, hey, can these people please have a reasonable, you know, efficient time? Like, I'm not gonna browbeat anyone. I know what it's like when they're understaffed. I know what it's like when they're overworked. 
can you guys just please take care of my constituents? And I think that, you know, that little extra bit of human touch. If I have to show up, I'll show up. If I have to just make a phone call, I'll make a phone call. I love the actual constituent service work. Like that to me is the most fun part of the job. It's the part that like I get really excited about when something comes in the inbox or someone calls me because I gave out my phone number thousands of times in the campaign. So people from all over the district have it, you know, and to, to be able to show up and to make a difference like that in person, that's my bread and butter. That's what I love doing. And um, I think uh, while I'm working on that, I've I pre-filed like 13 you know legislative draft requests that are now coming back. And like I was saying before, you know, like they deal with everything from utilities to roads to you know freedom of information. So I've been working on the policy stuff, going to the Democratic House caucus meetings, you know, down in Richmond on a few occasions. And while I'm doing this, I'm getting invitations so many times a day from everyone, right? Mm -hmm. And so I have to be judicious, make you know, pick what I can do. And so I've done a lot of events within the district and as well as in Northern Virginia. And I decided, well, you know what? There were a lot of people who helped me out during the campaign. Now is the time before session for me to go and help them out too. So like I was one of you know, um, the four LGBT people who went through Emerge on Virginia's boot camp this year. And so you know, this is a group that you know, they train Democratic women to run for office. And <laughs> it was so funny, like I was talking to Andrew Duke Steele this weekend. Um, who's Emerge America's founder, and I asked her, I was like, well, did you guys have a debate, or you know, did you guys talk about what to do if trans women start applying? You're like, yeah. And you're like, anyone who's a woman is a woman, so we'll trade you. Okay, is everyone good? Yep, okay, great, done. That was a short discussion. <laughs> you know, it's like, yay, you, you get it, this is good. Um, and so I never felt anything other than just like the love of my Emerge sisters as soon as I got there, right? And so I decided, hey, you know, um, Julie Copeland from uh, Merch, uh, she's executive director for Merge Virginia. She asked me when I was in Richmond, she said, hey, um, Merge California wants to know if you would be able to do an event for them. Can you headline over there? And it's like, as a personal favor to you, Julie, absolutely. You know, because, you know, you trained me, you help, you help me out, I'm all in, let's go. And so that's what I did. I flew out to California this weekend and I, I, um, I keynoted one event where they had like all these emerge, you know, graduates and, you know, training, you know, folks who, you know, wanted to take photos of me and just like hear a speech and stuff I'm like, yeah, I'm here to help you out. It was their fundraiser. Like, yeah, I'm here. Let's do it. And I think having someone in my case who has a national profile while being elected at the local level, <laughs> and I don't want that to change for the record. Um, if anyone's going to be the first trans senator, it's who I'm talking to, not me. <laughs> I like working in Richmond. I don't want to work in DC. I really, <laughs> really don't. <laughs> um, Richmond sounds like a nice, a nice change of pace from DC. Yeah. There's a lot going on right Here's now in DC. I could get beat done in Richmond. <laughs> <laughs> Washington, uh, man, like, what? Yeah, that's that's a whole different animal. I worked, like, you know, I, I worked for National Journal for three and a half years. And getting laid off from there was the, one of the best things that ever happened to me because it was just like, I got laid off on a Friday, I started yoga on a Monday, <laughs> and life became instantly better, right? It was just like, and the thing is, when I got to National Journal in the first place, I loved the people I worked with, I loved the job, especially when I got there. Three and a half years of working two full-time jobs, one job an hour away from the other in good traffic, I was burnt out. Yeah. I was so burnt out by the, by the end of it, and it was just like, yeah, I'm, I'm ready to go. But it's just other stuff um, I was up to. Um, so while I was out in California, you know, so I did the, um, the merge thing on Saturday. Sunday comes around, and I had my own fundraiser out there over in Castro, because why not? It's like, yeah, if I'm going to do this, let's go to Castro. And I'm meeting all these people, one after the next after the next. And then this older fellow is sitting there talking to my campaign manager, and he says to me, um, he reaches his hands out like this, and he's shaking, his eyes are welling up. And I was like, hey, how you doing? And he goes, he goes like this, and he goes, these hands touched Harvey's, mm. talking about Harvey Milk's. Wow. That's a moment. Wow. That's a moment right there where you go, a lot of people are protecting their hopes, and a lot of people see a lot in what we accomplished together. It's not just me, mm -hmm. but they get a lot of hope from what we just did, and I hope they continue that legacy. It's easy to get burned out. You've got yeah. a lot on your plate, a lot of responsibility. 
what does Danica Rohm do for fun? I know you have a band, you're part of a band. Tell us what you do for fun. How do you relax? <laughs> I'm relaxed playing guitar. <laughs> um, to be honest, at this point, as a stepmom who is constantly doing policy and government stuff, I want to give you the really fun answer from my 20s of, you know, just like, you know, just basically dominating on stage and, you know, raging the late night. It's not my life anymore. If I'm not on the campaign trail or if I'm not governing, I'm spending time with my partner, I'm spending time with, you know, my stepdaughter because the hardest part about this is spending so much time away from family. Yeah. And I know what it's like to have an absent parent. You know, my dad died when I was three years old. I know what that's like. I never want to be that absent kid. And so it's, or, you know, that absent adult to my kid, um, that absent parent to my kid. And to be honest, like the fun stuff is like, I'm in my car listening to Judas Priest Painkiller and just like, you know, rocking out on 495 or something. That's cool. Um, that's that's pretty fun for me. That's but some self care right there. That is some self care. Self -care. Um, and otherwise, yoga. Yoga is definitely my uh, self care and fun of choice. Okay. And final question. Yeah. Um, we 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 we've talked about uh, the responsibility you have this year. A number of trans candidates won. I'm sure so mm -hmm. many more are thinking about running. What would you say to any trans person who's thinking about stepping up and running for office? Number one is go get trained. Um, so the Victory Institute, uh, the Canadian Lesbian Victory Institute, they have a candidate campaign training program. Absolutely, highly recommend going to that. Andrea Jenkins and I both went. Um, we were classmates together, Philippe Cunningham, last year, or I guess the prior year he had done it. So yeah, they will train you and it is intense. It is also fabulous and fun, but you learn a lot. If you're a democratic woman, go to Emerge, you know, go get yourself trained there as well you know, and make sure that you're trained so that you know what you're getting yourself into. So that you, you know, when you get in, you need to have known, it's like, okay, what do I say about me? What do I say about them? What do they say about me? What do they say about them? You know, you gotta have all your strategic assumptions, understanding finance plans, understanding what an automated phone dialer does. You're gonna want that, the automated phone dialer. Don't just call 200 numbers yourself. Let the robot do it. <laughs> it's, it's much easier. Use either call fire or phone burner. No one told me that So until it was like, until March when Delegate John Bell said that during a Democratic House caucus training. So that's a good piece of uh, advice right there because that will save you hours on your call time so you can get out and do your doors more um, so that's good and the last thing I would I would mention with this is you know the same you know my Catholic upbringing you know just goes back to that quote from St. Francis of Sales be who you are and be that well don't let anyone define your narrative own your narrative first and if you're transgender well great go be your fabulous transgender self and make sure that you are focused on those core quality of life issues that your constituents desperately need you to take care of. And you can do that in an inclusive way that says, yeah, I'm transgender and I'm gonna be a really good public servant. Wow, Delegate Electrum, thanks for joining us and blazing those trails. Coming.